want to quickly thank the uh, the organizers. You know, more and more career development uh, professionals are actually reaching out to each other, and I think that that's very, very important, especially in the era that we are in, to really share, collaborate, and and look at what other people are doing. Why why reinvent the wheel each time, right? There's so many great ideas out there. We can put our heads together and and share, right? Let's not be greedy. <laughs> I, I joke all the time with um, with some of my leadership that uh, we don't want to give away all of our secrets. Um, I'm really enjoying uh, the collaboration, and I think I'm probably either setting up calls like this, or somebody else is facilitating them, and and we'll try to uh, save a little bit of time for some question and answer. And now, what I want to talk about is what is our role. And I thought a lot about what our role was when I was working on our rebranding strategy. And what I came up with, looking at some of our student-driven feedback, and really trying to incorporate student feedback in, in many of our programs, including, for example, our Q Passport to Success and many other tools that we use. And it's important to understand what they feel uh, about it, right? How do they feel about it? What are some of their thoughts? And um, is it something that do they see it the same way that we see it, right? Are those are those perceptions similar or are they completely different? And I think that many of our focus groups and we've started the student advisory board both at the undergraduate and graduate level have been really, I guess you could say, eye-openers when it comes to a lot of that, including some of our technology, um, for example, simplicity and some of the reasons why we're looking at transitioning to, for example, handshake and things like that is really based on a lot of our feedback from students. And so our role is really connecting passion to purpose, fostering a vibrant, campus-wide, diverse, and active career culture that celebrates success. It's the most visible and essential component of a university or a college life. Success means something different to every individual. If we don't connect to our students, really listen to them, we will not engage them. So how can we connect passion to purpose? I think when it comes to career counseling and you think about it, we sit with the student and we talk to them about their resume and their cover letter and it's very easy to give feedback right away. And we can talk about connecting passion to purpose all day, but there's a disconnect, there's a missing link, there's a gap, there's an area of opportunity. We aren't helping them with that process, which is so important. And so one of the reasons why we launched the You Matter series, which uh, really focuses on that self-exploration and really, really vital, I think, for students to, to begin that process as early as they can in their career. I just think that it's something that I myself did in my career too late. And if I could give one piece of advice to students, it would be <laughs> don't wait, really explore that motivation and passion and don't be afraid, right? I mean, I'm writing a book now that focuses a lot on humanity, our social responsibility, purpose, humility, and connecting passion to purpose in the big picture. And I think that if I would not have sort of done that workshop, the You Matter workshop, for myself, I wouldn't be writing my, my, my book. Some of you have asked me if I could talk a little bit about uh, alumni relations and what I can tell you is that it is a part of our strategic initiatives and it is a big part of it and so um, I think I would link it to your mentorship program I think that you know whether it the mentorship program sits with alumni relations or whether it sits with career services is really besides the point but what's important is that they have that active you have that active collaboration and communication with alumni relations and alumni or, or friends of the university, as well as the employers, right? Which are the employers that have a very strong representation of alumni from a university? We have, for example, some employers that have 50 to 100, 100 alumni working there. And uh, alumni relations, if they don't know, uh, and I'm sure they do with some of their da database analytics, but I think that's a conversation that you can have, and there's a lot of opportunity there if you really dive in. So let's take a look at, for example, what we use as far as innovative platforms are concerned. And you'll see that this is just kind of a snapshot of 
and you can see just sort of at the top, and these aren't our numbers, this is just a sample, but you can see you know, how easy it is to kind of give you a dashboard when it comes to median salary, which industries are being represented, and where students are getting these offers. For example, are they getting it from our proprietary system? Are they getting it from networking? Are they getting it from faculty referrals, etc.? Very, very important. And I think, you know, it's gainful employment, right? We talk so much about gainful employment and, and, and really the, the, um, the importance of collecting that, that data. Why? Because we need to know where we're at, right? At the end of the day, we need to know where we're at. And what makes this platform very innovative and so great is that you can turn it around and you can offer it to students. And what I mean by that is students actually get an incentive by completing their QSS survey, their equivalent student survey. And what that is, is they actually get, um, for example, they will, how many employers hired in this particular month, or how many employers hired, what was the median salary, for example, for their particular major and things like that. So that gives them an idea of their value and it helps them really negotiate with employers once they do get that offer, having an idea of what the what others are getting and um, and also the timing. If you think about how, how sensitive and how important the timing is when a student understands that, say for example, accounting, right, there's a peak between uh, September and November and what, what time to really start that application process becomes, becomes very important. So I think that um, this is just one platform that I wanted to kind of share with you so that you can kind of get a glimpse into what's out there if you are looking to make some transitions, 1220 is one of them, in addition to Handshake that I highly recommend. What I also wanted to share with you is, you know, I talked a little bit about Project Track Forward earlier, and really it's about forward momentum. How do you build forward momentum? And what is forward momentum? So for example, if you, if you make goal when it comes to your career outcome, say your goal is 90% employed by six months, by the six month mark. May 2016 class and you make goal prior to that six month deadline so post graduation from from May 2016 would be say December 2016 and say you make goal at October or September and so chances are to make goal if you look at kind of for example the benchmarks that I have here you'll see that um, week one 50 percent employed is the goal so maybe if you're employed at graduation for your entire class is 50%, you have a good chance of kind of making it to the 90 mark, say week week 21. So say you make goal by October, I call that forward momentum, and you've built a, uh, some momentum, you actually have a couple extra months to, uh, to hit goal. You've already hit goal, so what can you do? You can shift your priorities and really focus on the students that are graduating the subsequent class, and I call that forward momentum because you get kind of a head start and we have to be realistic. We have very lean teams. Some of our locations, some of you have talked to me about, actually have, have sent some questions in to me about short staffing and things like that. And really you have to be creative and you have to leverage all of your resources. And so with those things in mind, um, when it comes to career, career centers all over the nation, having these challenges, you have to really think about your priorities when it comes to career coaching. So what I'm, what I'm saying is you're not, I'm not saying that you don't um, see the freshman and sophomore, you do, but you, you, you try to do more group group presentations, orientations, workshops at that level so that the focus can really be on the students that are actively looking um, and who, who are about to graduate. And so maybe the timing of when you will see those students changes so that you'll be seeing more students who are about to graduate prior to graduation so you can do those second and third and fourth mock interviews and, and really strategize with the students that, for example, are not getting a position and you're trying everything in your power to really dig in and figure out, okay, maybe it's the phone screen, maybe it's something they're saying, maybe it's a question, maybe they're asking for too much, maybe they want a job around the corner and that you're not willing to, to, to commute very far and, and it's unrealistic expectations and really figuring out what it is. Maybe they're not shaving the day of the interview, I, I don't know, maybe they are, you know, smoking and, and it's coming out on their, on their shirt and, and, and the employer can can smell it and you know it could be a, a number of different things so this new concept when it comes to uh, tracking forward versus starting at graduation 
and calling people, you know, students who, who maybe have never even come to the Career Center, but starting way earlier and you're sending out those resumes because they are readily referable a year in advance. So by the time they graduate, those students already have a job. It's a win-win. It's a win-win for the Career Center. It's a win-win for the student. It's a win-win for the employer. So I think you're going to hear a lot more about Project Track Forward and career outcomes models that are looking towards this. And this is something that, that I actually implemented on a national level in my former institution after I had um, great success. I had the uh, number one ranked uh, career center in the nation uh, for, for, for multiple years uh, consecutively. And, and this is uh, part of the way that we, we actually were able to have such success was the fact that we were actually investing our efforts timely and, and early and, and, and just extremely uh, proactively. You know, how do we lead change as career services professionals? I talk a lot about us being the compass to implementing a career development map and journey for our students. So who really defines their experience, right? I think they manage their career to some extent, but we also help define that experience and what is that experience with our career center. And if we really want to be innovative, we have to really be that change, and I, and I love I love this quote uh, from Gandhi, I always use it. And also to really understand that it's important that we re rediscover really relevant information on how to help navigate students. Um, there are a lot of really good resources out there. There's a lot of good resources that, that uh, we've used traditionally for many, for many, many years. We don't necessarily need to abandon them, but I think we need to, to supplement them with some of our new resources. The recording of a video interview for a student, being able to to give them the opportunity to look at themselves. I think that that can be very powerful. Uh, in addition, self-assessments and helping students ask the question, who am I? Career exploration, where am I going? And action plan, how do I get there? These toolkits really, um, I started, uh, I don't know, a number of years ago, and I think it's because we saw that many career centers have resume templates, and then other career centers don't really believe in them and I think that there's no right answer but I do think that for people who don't have any structure I think a template can be very effective and and for others who um, who have that individualization or personalization of their resume we don't want to take that away but I think more importantly it's 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 the format and, and what are they highlighting and for example if someone's experience speaks speaks volumes we want that to be up front and center um, if someone's education if they're you know, a valedictorian, I mean, that's something that we'd want to highlight. So the question of where it goes really, really, I will say it depends on, on, on the student and, and what they're really trying to um, target and how they want to position themselves. And so when I looked at, you know, the power of collaboration with deans and, 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 and faculty, I mean, it was unbelievable. And it varies at different universities. Some universities, there's silos. Other universities, faculty are incredibly involved. And I think that um, there's opportunity, right? So, so if you have the opportunity to sit down with one of the professors who's a scholar and, and to create, for example, a career handbook that speaks to sample interview questions in the field, a sample resume that's specific to that discipline, a cover letter that speaks the language of accounting, the interview questions that are specific to finance, the resources, affiliations, the organizations that you can that you can actually leverage as a student or beyond, beyond, as well as what are the action verbs associated with that particular field. And, and the list goes on and on and on, website, resources, you know, articles on the topic. I think that the power of collaboration and really using the faculty, I think, to really build and publish, right? How many career services professionals publish, for example, a handbook like this that is can be so useful? And the reason why we actually created this particular handbook was because there was a need, right? And so what we saw was students were having trouble in game simulation and programming. It was just incredibly competitive. Blizzard gets, gets 7,000 resumes a week. They have a bulletproof, <laughs> well, I think, is it a window or a ga gate or something outside their, their, um, <laughs> their establishment. And after they went through, of course, I had my older brother who was, you know, uh, a game and simulation uh, programming uh, guru genius as a guest speaker and, and really uh, do some mock interviews with the students who weren't getting jobs. I think I, I remember about seven of them that actually came to my office in, in the same day. But all seven of them got a job after going through this the handbook and going to that that um, panel event where that coaching was offered. 
and that feedback um, from somebody in the industry. And I'm telling you, students saw, <laughs> for example, my older brother as a as a rock star, <laughs> as a rock star. Literally, they had him cornered in my office, and you know, after the, after the event was over, and, and just wouldn't let him go. So I'm taking feedback from students and um, looked, at, looked at sort of the participation rates for the Q Passport and then revamped it completely. And we're, we're actually printing at the moment our, our new Passport 2016, which is, uh, I would say, about 10 times better. We're, we're really happy with it. You know, many of us inside out, but sometimes I think outside in when it comes to a career center, what I mean is that magnet, right? Students hear, they see that career culture, and it just attracts uh, students to your office. And I have personally coached career centers and and been charged with turning around career centers that did not have anybody come into their office for weeks. And then I've been to career centers where students walk in every 30 seconds. I've sort of seen both sides. And I think that this magnet concept is really what we need to focus on. Um, and then there's students that, you know, it's that center feel that you want to really create, right? We want referrals from students. We want, we want referrals from employers. And we want to motivate the, un the unmotivated. We need, to, we need to believe that we can help these job seekers. So an increased focus when it comes to that motivation and instilling sort of their sense of belonging at the university as well as your own team's sense of belonging uh, when it comes to uh, being a career coach and being part of a high performance team. I'd say the empowerment and ownership uh, to create sort of that driving force. And you also want to project that, that there's a team behind these students, not just one advisor. If that advisor is not there today, is that the only person that they can see? No, they have a whole team. And so cross-training, I think, is very important for career services. You know, I think that uh, when students really see and believe that you uh, care about their best interest, you know, I, people ask me about my master's in public health, and, and I know a couple other directors who have a master's in public health, you know, how compassionate, for example, some of my team members are and how important that is when it comes to coaching a student. Uh, when it comes to career outcomes, and when it comes to looking a student in the eye who just went through a divorce, who just got lost their job, who's afraid that they can't make it to the next day and pay their rents, and and they're on a you know it's time sensitive. They only have a week or three three weeks before they would have to move out or whatever it is. And being able to look them in the eye and say, "Keep a positive attitude. We're going to get you there. You, you're going to get it." You're gonna get it, you know. I believe in them. I believe you, you. You're gonna knock it out of the park. I got a good feeling about this position, and and you know, helping them not give up. I think is so 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 important. According to the results of the 2011 NACE student survey, underrepresented students, African American, Asian American, and Hispanic American, are more likely to utilize their college's career center in order to assist them with their career preparation. Since our career center is a major attraction for this group of students. It is important that our career center staff provides services and programs that will meet their needs. So we must address the career development and preparation needs of underrepresented students' strategies for reaching this population, including programming, internal and external resources for assisting them, and staff competency in meeting these students' needs. It's also beneficial to share personal experiences and research as it relates to working with underrepresented students. Absolutely important. I mean, we have ex-offenders that, you know, that need that need assistance and, you know, I know for example, AT&T, American Express, UPS, Marriott, uh, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Sprint, Energy Air. I mean, there's a number of companies that will hire. Organization is half the battle in career services, but I really mean it. Know what those resources are and, and have them readily available for our students. And then what about career changers, right? Uh, military students, veterans, job seekers with criminal records or, or disabilities. I mean, very important to work with the right resources on campus. Interviewing, right, versus interviewing. And I think that many students want to maximize the, when it comes to their impact and purpose in life. And we look at the on-campus recruiting model and we look at um, on-campus interviewing and we say, these companies are not coming on campus, and so what can we do? What can we do? How can we help students navigate these murky off-campus searches through advising nonprofit resources and employer programming? Thus, we need to create new best practices and capitalize on existing insights to help increase our career center's effectiveness and brand equity among students that want to do well by doing good. It's important that we take advantage of externship opportunities at community-based organizations and help these 
purposeful, career seekers get clear visibility, get connected, and get hired for jobs in corporate responsibility, sustainability, international development, impact investing, social enterprise, and education reform. And, you know, service learning opportunities is a great way to do that, right, to really meet sort of specific learning objectives and, and completing some kind of uh, community service work at the same time. They're very structured. They require self-reflection, self-discovery, I think, with um, gaining specific values, skills, and, and knowledge required uh, for success in the field. Social media and digital identity development. <laughs> when, I, when I was interviewing uh, for a position, I remember the consultant had me, I think, in the top 10. And she said, you know, you're the only one in the top 10 that doesn't have a PhD. And I really like you. She said, in two words, tell me what you're going to do at this university. And this university was a top, you know, it was a, it was a big 10. And I said, champion change. And she loved that. And then she said, you know what? You tell me you're a visionary. I want you to prove to me that you're visionary. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to create a video resume. <laughs> and I wrote the script in a day, and I um, didn't even finish editing it. You know, just directed the whole thing, um, although I did give credit to, to the person that was filming it. Just really enjoyed the process and, and sent that to her, and, and she loved it, and she said, you're a finalist. <laughs> when I was creating it, I, I, I wanted to innovate video resumes before they actually get popular. Record a video resume where with, with you know, just behind a white, on a white wall and very boring. I wanted to uh, make it exciting. I wanted to, for example, walk into a cafe and say, Un café con leche, más leche de café, por favor. You know, some people could say, oh, he speaks Spanish. And, 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 and without uh, having to say that I speak Spanish, and I, I think I didn't actually uh, film that scene, but the editing got so incredibly expensive that I said, okay, that's it. You know, eight minutes, all right. It's never going to be three minutes or two minutes, that's fine. Let's put it out there. So I think about it, and I know it's coming, right? Video resumes, we, we did a virtual business card pilot. Digital identity development has become increasingly important for students as they transition into their careers. Social media has provided opportunities and challenges for students and administrators as they strive to create a personal brand that is both authentic and professional. Thus, we need to share the good, the bad, and the ugly of how social media can impact a student's future career aspirations, and we need to explore new ways to share and teach students about digital identity, how it relates to their career profile and brand. You know, if you're tired of the traditional informational sessions and campus recruiting programs, let's look towards social media, let's look to hosting on-campus programming, site visits that offer that student career exposure and alumni employer engagement. We're learning ways to better connect students and alumni via LinkedIn uh, to develop sort of on-campus programming that, com that combines career exposure and networking and implements sort of the um, off-campus site visits that provide students, I would say, an insider's view to that company. And I think we need to do more of that um, as we move forward uh, by leveraging social media. Career readiness. This is our career ready plan in my former institution. Some of you have emailed me your career ready plans and. NACE also has a very strong uh, definition of career readiness. I recommend that you visit their website to, to read that. Teaching students to manage their career. So we always emphasize interpersonal expectations. Inspiration, I think, is really at the heart of it all. Professional expectations, as you progress through life, you have to play well in the sandbox. You can't afford to burn bridges. Students need to understand uh, how important that is. Not accepting multiple offers, right? Or accepting an offer and then rejecting it and then accepting another offer and just the kind of the bridges that are burned through that process. And then business cards come and go. You know, they may change, but transferable skills remain. Every interaction that you have is your ability to elevate your brand. And that actually was something that one of my own mentors, um, Pedro Manrique, from Program Dean of Engineering, uh, uh, said to me, I think, in one of my very first sessions with him for coffee. New initiatives, right? So we talked about the toolkits a little bit. Um, project success, lead by example. We really want to celebrate student success. We capture their stories. We have a wall of fame that we have implemented and we put their pictures up and we write these articles and we send it to marketing and, and they love it. A process improvement manual of best practices that can really serve as a tool for onboarding is very important. Diversity and inclusion, looking at those underrepresented students, making sure that we are doing everything that we can, that we are treating students equally, including international students, and the new matter series we've talked about uh, a little bit earlier. Living and breathing a campus-wide career culture, 
The role of career services is to be committed to empowering students to achieve their educational and career goals. It's important to take advantage of strategic partnerships with faculty and colleagues towards improved collaborative process solutions to help capture and create new collective best practices. Our role is to help students gain self-understanding and connect their interests, values, and skills with the knowledge about careers and life beyond college and university life. As we start to think about envisioning our future in career services, we can, we can think about the hypothesis as really helping guide us. That will bring us to questions and go ahead and enter them in the chat box. I will break for a moment um, just to run and grab a glass of water and then I will continue. Feel free to email me if you can stick around and look forward to uh, hearing from you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity and hope to see many of you at NACE right around the corner, right? We got it uh, June 7th through 10th in Chicago, in Chicago, right down the street over there, a magnificent mile. See you then. Good night, everybody.